Here in Devon, in the tranquil Tamar Valley, is a port that once bustled with industry. Overground, farmers supplied Britain's growing towns and cities with fresh produce. Daffodils set for London. While underground, miners extracted copper and precious minerals. Burning! Now at Morwellan Quay, archaeologists Alex Langlands and Peter Ginn and historian Ruth Goodman are going back in time to the early 1900s to live the lives of Edwardian farmers for a full calendar year. They'll not just be farming, but getting to grips with the rural industries that once brought wealth to Devon. Oh, oh wow! We got something! So far, the team have breathed new life into the farm, undertaking high-risk ventures and turning to the latest farming practices of the age. Look! Just down here, we have trout. We have succeeded in our new enterprise. Now it's December on the Edwardian farm. With winter set in, Christmas looming, the team faced the challenge of earning a living in one of the hardest months of the year. Oh. They need to profit from their livestock. That is never a job I enjoy. <laughs> Leave the farm in search of work. Look! Look! A hot tap! Whoa! And head to the coast to reap the ocean's bounty. Oh, Peter, in luck again, mate. Really? We're we luck again. The dawn of the 20th century brought great changes to society. The Industrial Revolution had enticed rural workers away from farms to the cities with the promise of higher wages and a better standard of living. In towns and big houses, people are living a really modern life. On motor cars and piped water and WCs and all the other benefits of the Edwardian age, and yet, out in the countryside, quite large numbers of people were still having to deal with a very much older way of living. With poverty rife in the countryside, Edwardian farmers often had to find work away from their land. In the Tamar Valley, many took advantage of the north and south Devon coasts to profit from the county's other great industry, fishing. Now, there would have almost certainly have been dedicated fishermen at the time who would have spent their whole lives fishing, but there's also that class of people who were kind of fishermen farmers, people who had one foot on the land and one foot in the sea. So um, we're hoping that uh, we can uh, turn our unskilled farm labourers' hands to a bit of uh, fishing and maybe with a few crab and perhaps a lobster we'll be able to make ourselves a few pennies before Christmas. It wasn't just men who had to look for extra work. In the age that gave rise to the suffragette movement, Ruth is also hoping to earn her own wage away from home. For many women in rural areas, getting to work was made possible by the mass production of an easy mode of transport. I've got this bicycle. I'm really excited about it because in the Edwardian period, they were suddenly available to everybody, including really ordinary people. It means that there's a new way of getting about. You can travel much bigger distances. It gives you a real freedom, especially for women. Um, so I'm quite excited about having a go at this Edwardian bicycle. And I've got a book to tell me how to ride it. 
Here we go. It's under B for bicycle. There we are. Bicycle to ride. Uh, mount the machine from an elevation. And as soon as it is a run a little way, spring yourself on the step and throwing the right leg over on the backbone, drop a little forward into the saddle. And the moment the machine appears to be falling to the left, draw the left hand a little towards you. Have the effect of turning the driving wheel in the same direction, readjusting the balance. Flipping heck, how would you ever learn to ride a bike from instructions like that? <laughs> Some people you know actually made these available as a sort of form of charity so that ordinary people could get jobs, get on your bike and find a job. It really meant something. Here we go. Watch out, mad lady coming through. The bicycle enabled women to become an integral part of a more mobile workforce. Wow, speed, freedom. It's just great. Before Alex can take to the seas to fish for crabs and lobsters, he'll need the right equipment. He's come to meet Cornish fisherman and craftsman, Nigel Legg. Nigel's been making traditional lobster pots for over 40 years. He weaves them using willow, or withies as they're known in the trade. Fishermen have been making lobster pots in this way for over 150 years. Hello Nigel. Hello. Nice to meet you. And you. So this is uh, the lobster basket then? Well, a lobster pot. A lobster pot, yeah. sorry. Yeah, we um very, very keen to get out fishing, but we need some traditional lobster pots, as you right. say. Well, you've come to the right place and um, right time of the year, so we can have a go at making one if you want. Yeah, jolly good. So where are you starting? You're actually starting almost sort of at the top of... You start at the top, you bind the mouth, yep. make the mouth, then everything's sticking up in the air and then like a like a big shuttlecock. Yep. And then we pull the withies down yep. and tie them into the stand and you'll get the actual shape of the pot. Ah, right. And then you start off binding and just gradually get bigger and bigger and bigger as you go around. Let's just have a look then well, the master at work. Just, well, I didn't master it, but then... The binding now is getting a little bit small, so I'm just going to add a couple of withies to it. Right, so okay. Just, just cripple the ends like that. Cripple the ends? Yeah, just bend them. Right. Bend them. And you'll trap them under that bar there, so they're in, they're in and underneath now, trapped, so they can't come out. And then just yep. catch this one old and... Okay. Like that. Get a twist, right. It's, it's always the way with these crafts. I get these fantastic windows into the crafts world, and I think to myself, God, I'd, I'd love to do that. But, you know, crafts are like this, are really, you know, a life's work. Well, it's a little bit of fun now. It's still hard work, but years ago, it, it certainly was different now. It, you had to do it because it was, if you didn't make pots, you didn't go fishing. Yeah, of course. Um, and you had the old man there, sort of giving you a swipe with a withy, occasionally every time you got it wrong. So it was, uh, um, He's not there now, is he? He's near now, no. <laughs> right. Once Nigel finishes binding the sidebars, he's ready to weave the bottom of the pot. Just grab a handful like this. Yeah. In underneath there. Right. You can see the shape of the pot coming now. Yeah, definitely. You can see a lobster in there yet? Not yet. Go put the, put the bottom in there. Right, OK. So the whole thing is woven together, in effect. OK, well, all we're, all we're doing now is going towards the middle. Yeah. Peter and I are quite anxious about this. You know, how, how long are we going to have to sort of spend on the coast, fingers crossed, waiting for that long? This time of year, about three and a half months, is it? No. <laughs> <laughs> no, if it was fine weather, I wouldn't be surprised to have a catch of four or five crabs and two lobsters. Really? I, wouldn't be, I wouldn't be surprised. See, we could come good here. We could do, yeah, yeah. I also wouldn't be surprised if we didn't catch anything. Oh, it's closing it all up. Yeah, just tightening it all up. Brilliant. Well, that's your pot. There it is. Down to you now. I yeah. can't do no more. <laughs> right, good luck. Well, thanks ever so much for your time, Nigel. That's right, no problem. It's been a real pleasure. 
Alex and Peter's success as fishermen will depend on the coast's unpredictable weather. They've agreed to exchange their labour for a share in the catch with Brixham fisherman Bill Wakeham. Bill has spent his working life at sea, catching crabs and lobsters off the South Devon coast. A fisherman's ability to make a living has always been dictated by tides and winds. Hello there, Bill. Hello. All right. Hello, how are you? All right. Hi. Could have been a better morning. Is there yeah. a problem with the weather? Yeah, you've got all uh, easily swell here, onshore breeze. Right. And you won't go anywhere today with this, you know, even knowing what you're doing. Right. So, so this old... wind would blow us into the shore? Yeah, and smash you up and the old swell that's in the water here ain't going to do you no good at all. So it's it's off for the it's day a, then? It's an encore. <laughs> that's a real but, shame. Yeah, it is. Put it this way, you're better off a starving fisherman than a dead one. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> do, you, do you think this will last for long? Well, I'm hoping not. You know, it can be here for a week, two weeks, three weeks even. What we do then is vice versa. I'm going to look for a job on a farm if it goes on too long. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Can we leave this with you then? And if you get a chance to stick it out in the next few days yeah. or weeks, uh, and then maybe we'll come back and give you a hand hauling them out. Yeah, no trouble at all. Okay. And what you get out of them is yours sort of thing, you know. Perfect. Great stuff. Well, look, hopefully we'll see you in the next couple okay, of weeks. Lads. Okay. Cheers, Take then. care. That is such a shame. I, I know, really it's a big looking, disappointment, isn't it? Really looking forward to it. Listen, we've got beef at home, haven't we? Yeah. We're at the sea, let's yep. get some oysters. oysters. Oysters and beef, winning combination, always. They're a bit pricey though, mate, aren't they? Ruth's away. Well, we're supposed to be on a budget. Ruth's away. Like many Edwardian women, Ruth is after part-time work as a domestic servant. She's come to Lamp Hydrock House, the Edwardian country estate of wealthy politician Lord Robarts and his family. In its heyday, as many as 80 part-time and live-in staff were employed to look after the house. At times of year when they've got special cleaning to do, special preparations to do, it was usual in the Edwardian period for other people to come in and help do a bit of charring or so forth. A bit of extra money. Lanhydrock House was almost destroyed by a devastating fire in 1881. It was rebuilt with a new design that reflected the high morals and the strict Anglican principles of the Robarts family. Gosh, this is quite some house and quite some kitchen. Today, Lan Hydrock is managed by the National Trust and its curator is Paul Holden. What's this um, book then? This is uh, Robert Kerr's book, A Gentleman's House, and Lan Hydrock House was based around this. Um, it, right. it was laid out to achieve high moral planning throughout the house and the segregation of male and female within the staff quarters as well. Uh, it actually says here, and I quote from this, the working rooms of men ought to form one division and those of the women another. Wow, so completely separate. Complete segregation. This family were extremely high Anglican family and they really didn't want anything going on under their roof that they couldn't explain. And then it goes one stage further again in that leading away from the kitchens, you've got a stone staircase for men leading up to their quarters and a wooden staircase for women leading up to their quarters. <laughs> the women's staircase being wood for their slighter frames, that's what Kerr tells us. And where Gosh. those staircases meet at the top, there's a locked door. <laughs> no, hanky-panky. <laughs> Only the butler would have had the key. <laughs> and it's firmly in my pocket. <laughs> in the early 1900s, over one and a half million Edwardians worked in domestic service. As an industry, it was the country's biggest employer. Look, look, a hot tap. 
just amazing. Whoa! Before cleaning the house, Ruth can't resist exploring one of the most advanced kitchens of its day. Ice boxes! Ice cream moulds! This is a patented knife cleaning machine. Oh no! Oh, that doesn't look right. Ah, never was any good with machines. Oh, there is. It's a dairy. So it's all here. Everything's here. Absolutely everything you'd want. In wealthy Edwardian houses, few women were ever employed as head chefs. But there was no shortage of less glamorous jobs. This is where I really belong, isn't it? In the sluice room. <laughs> Lowest to the low. <laughs> this is a quite a strange space in a house, sort of somewhere that was changing rapidly in the Edwardian times. This is where you get rid of the waste, the overnight waste. So that's from people's personal hygiene, including that trip in the middle of the night that you don't want to make to the far, far, far distant. Use the chamber pot. Um, it, of course, all has to be cleared up. And sluice rooms are where it happens. Now this, this is just fantastic. This is the, such a leap forward in sluice room technology. I've got a proper porcelain sink to deal with it all. I've got running water. And then, most amazingly of all, this is, in itself, a flush system. This is a sort of WC for washing in, for washing pots in. By the start of the 20th century, flushing water closets were being widely used in wealthy Edwardian houses. If it's um, more than you might imagine, then we've got the system. Although systems vary greatly, the most commercially successful was the valve and siphon design, invented by Thomas Crapper. And this wasn't the only innovation that promised to revolutionise domestic life. Ah, and there is the future. Look at that. Gosh, the star vacuum cleaner. That's the carpet end. And then we've just got a cylinder that you pump. You pump up and down like a churn. Oh my giddy aunt. Oh, I've never seen one of those before. And then, and then a more, I think this is a two-person model. One to hold the hose, and one to make it work. <laughs> He's mad! Despite needing help to operate it, this latest Edwardian contraption was far more practical than the first vacuum cleaner, invented in 1901. That required horsepower, a petrol engine, and six people to feed long hoses through windows. I'm definitely going to need somebody else to help me with this. However, as Ruth and her helper Felicia soon discover, the later hand pump models didn't necessarily make housework any easier. Is it doing much suction? Uh, no. So should we try the other one? Is anything coming out of this one? Oh, yes. <laughs> Definitely. I can more hear it. That freedom. sounds more yeah, like it. Isn't it? <laughs> it's not the easiest thing to control, is it? <coughs> it is picking things up. Yeah. Who would buy one of these? I think they're the sort of thing you buy for somebody else, you buy for your servants, you know? It would be a lovely idea, I think. We should have those in the homes. The maids will enjoy using some. Yeah. I'm sure it would be much more hygienic. Generations of maids muttering under their breath. <laughs> yeah, bring back the dust <laughs> run and run. <laughs> I'll go and get it. Yeah. <laughs> Often working up to 17 hours a day, a female domestic servant could expect an income of only £16 a year. While Ruth's away on the farm, Alex and Peter have to fend for themselves. In many cases, with the depression in farming, it was more often not the women that made money in the household, wasn't it? Yeah. 
because they could go out and bring back a wage. So the men were merely keeping the place ticking over. I wonder if Ruth will send back her earnings to us <laughs> to support our drinking and gambling. Work like this was a reality for so many women in the past in Britain. Whether it be in a grand house like this, which obviously is at the very top end of the work, or a very ordinary house skivvying away. It's hard to think of a family that hasn't been touched by domestic service somewhere in its history. It's almost a history of female life, domestic service. In Ruth's absence, Peter is attempting to cook a carpet bag steak, a popular recipe of the time. I've cut a pocket inside the steak and I've stuffed them with oysters, hence the name carpet bag steak. And in the 1907 recipe version of this, they suggested sewing in the oysters. For centuries, oysters had been a poor man's dish. But in the 19th century, disease, pollution and overfishing had all but destroyed Britain's oyster beds. As a result, they became more commonly associated with the dinner tables of the upper classes. Well, I very much doubt we could afford to eat like this every night. <laughs> Only when Ruth isn't here. <laughs> it's a pretty blur steak. <laughs> No, I like my stone blue. I'm just slightly worried about the oysters. <laughs> <laughs> Here's to our uh, lads' night in. Oh, last time I let Peter anywhere near the kitchen. With little prospect of work on the coast until the weather improves, Alex and Peter must tend to the farm. Because of the cold, we're going to bring in our calves. We're going to wean them off their mothers so that the mothers get a chance to put on a bit of stores, some fat, over winter time and hopefully we'll be able to fatten the calves up. And we've got to start turning some of our investments into rewarding capital, haven't we? Right. Nice bed for them there. Yeah. Now the difficult part of extracting calves from their loving mothers. And a bull. <laughs> hmm. Right, where are they? They're up the top there, aren't they? Separating last season's calves from the herd is a tough yet essential job. See, they, know, they already know, don't they, that... Yeah, they know something's up. The cows are pregnant again. Weaning the older offspring allows the mothers to use their fat reserves over the winter to produce new healthy calves next year. I don't quite know what Peter's trying to achieve here. <laughs> Should he actually catch the animal, what on earth he's going to do with it when he gets to it? What are you going to do, negotiate with it, Peter? <laughs> Never going to win that battle. Never going to win it. Careful, mate, you, need a, you look like you need a chair. <laughs> A bucket of oats finally does the trick. Come on, it's all about food, mate. It's all about getting fat over winter. Nothing to be frightened of. Feeding the calves hay in the barn will fatten them up over winter. Go on, go on, get in. That is never a job I enjoy. This is where these guys are going to stay over winter. Just need to sort out some food and water. I think they're going to be very happy here. It's going to keep them out of the cold. Yeah, they look pretty contented. I'm not 
supposed to be seen or heard. It's supposed to be a magic cleaning fairy. The servants' quarters kept really separate. And servants were only up in these areas when everybody else had a reason to be somewhere else. If I hear or see anybody coming, I'm supposed to dive out of sight. Ruth's list of chores today includes cleaning Lan Hydrock's stately dining room in preparation for Christmas. It's quite fun being here in the dining room. It's like sort of being part of a great piece of theatre. For so many ordinary working people in the Edwardian period, there very few of the innovations had made it down to the bottom ends of society, but here, you can see them all. I mean, look. Electric light. Where else would you have seen that? Grand houses like this had electrics long before there was a national grid. Usually had sort of some sort of generator in the basement. So the chances are, any Edwardian ordinary person coming into this house, this would be the first time they'd ever seen an electric light bulb. This is the furniture polish I'm using. It's made of linseed oil and then um, a splash of gin and some black treacle. And the black treacle helps to give it a very warm colour, which is good on this darker furniture. And that slight stickiness helps too for the polishing. It brings up a really good shine. And the alcohol, well, that's sort of there as a sort of binder to make it easy to go on. And then it also makes it easy to develop a shine because it evaporates off, leaving less on the surface. It's a really simple polish, but very effective. <laughs> There's Christmas cards to the family. Compliments of the season and all good wishes from Mr. and Mrs. J. H. Dorr. <gasps> Christmas, 1906. Fancy that, having your Christmas cards printed rather than writing them out. <laughs> By the 1900s, it had become a custom in wealthier households to send printed Christmas cards, made possible by a cheaper, more reliable postal service. <laughs> may, the, may the ideal of chivalry the threefold, loyalty to God, to King and to your fellow men, be the guide of all your actions during the coming year. That's fantastic. <laughs> Oh, look. Oh, how appropriate. It's from a Mr. and Mrs. Glassock from Tintagel. <laughs> An Arthurian Christmas card. Benedictus Dominus. <laughs> For the wooden panelling, Ruth uses another popular cleaning product. You don't want a high polish finish in the same way as you do on furniture. You just want it clean. So... Best way. There's a cloth well wrung out in warm beer. It's just acidic enough to lift any grease. So you're going to get all the coal smuts and dust off. And when it dries, it leaves a very, very, very light stain. You do, of course, have to air the room rather thoroughly afterwards, otherwise you'll smell like a brewery. <laughs> It's a, t it's a tall order between him, though, and that one there. You reckon? Yeah. On the farm, Alex and Peter are keeping a close eye on their herd of cattle. Over the coming year, females will be used for breeding. Young bulls will be sold as beef. Look at him. Look at him now. He's slightly wider. Yeah. And what we're looking is that box conformation. Draw a rectangle. Does he fill that rectangle? Yes, he does. He's ready to slaughter, because that's what we're looking for. It is what we're looking for. Alex and Peter have already sent one young bull to slaughter. After hanging the carcass for four weeks, the meat is now ready to be cut into joints. Local butcher, Chris Roundsville, has come to the farm to cut up the animal's forequarter. 
This is the shin. This is the shin, which is the front leg. Right. And that's used for stewing. And that's the, as such, poorer quality stewing. It's a pretty lousy cut. But it's the tastiest if it's cooked right. Right. So this we're taking off here. This one here, we call it the box eater. That can be sliced up for chuck steak or we're gonna roll it for a roasting joint. Right. So so at the moment we're sort of working our way up. We started yeah. with the shin and the neck, which are which are pretty lousy cuts, yeah, you, aren't they? You, the, the further up you better you get. The better you get, okay. Yeah. So separate the ribs from the brisket now. Right. The brisket joint is taken from the breast section beneath the cow's first five ribs. These bones here would have been, certainly would have been boiled up for soup. The brisket is one of the cheapest beef cuts, requiring slow cooking for the meat to be tender. Wow. The turn of the century, you're having animals butchered for the marketplace. It's not necessarily for consumption on the farm, is it? No. You probably would have gone around with a cart and sold it off to the local villagers. and They didn't have fridges and freezers back then, so... Yeah. They would have probably slaughtered an animal, um, butchered it up, and then all the villagers would have come round yeah. and... So it's almost to order in many ways, isn't yeah, it? Yeah, they would you have know. come and had a little piece each of it. So. Yeah. Facing stiff competition from abroad with traditional crops such as wheat, the Edwardian farmer could still get a healthy price for beef. Then we will remove the ribs. I mean, today, how much would a bullock slaughtered and on the butcher's counter with all the work done, how much, how much would you be getting for it? Depending on the size, between £1,500 and £2,000. Right. There's a lot of expense to come out of it. Refrigeration costs, your waste disposal costs, yeah. um, slaughter cost. That's today, though, but of course in Edwardian times... They would have just slaughtered it themselves, so... Yeah. So it's, an, it's quite a nice earner then, actually, isn't it? For an Edwardian farmer, the proceeds from the sale of a single bull would have been equivalent to a month's wages. And we're going to put a cut sort of halfway up. In those bones, yeah. you'll see there's a little soft centre. Yeah. That's your marrow. Now when that's been opened up, that yeah. will help the marrow to come out and flavour the meat. Right, OK. Right, so that's number two. That's your rib. And that you just cook like that? They would cook that like that, yeah. Bit of rosemary, maybe. Yep. Delicious. Okay, next up. As well as making money from its meat, after slaughter, the bull's skin, or hide as it's known, would be sold to a nearby tannery to be turned into leather. Peter has come to meet tannery owner Andrew Parr to see how the process works. Hi, Andrew. It's good to see you again. Hi, Peter. How are you doing? All right. Is this our ruby red hide? This is your ruby red hide. So yeah. what have you done to it since I gave it to you? We, we put it in the, in the lime, in the lime yard for a fortnight. Right. And uh, that has just loosened the hair by the roots and we're just starting to dehair it now. And he's <laughs> right. You're ready to have a go. Oh, great. So just work it away from you. Just angle the blade back. Don't have it forward. And right. just and then squeeze it against the beam. Pin the hide there. That's it. And then just... You got it. That's fine. Fantastic. So is this a family business for you? Yes, it's been in the family since um, 1864. And there's always been a tannery here as far as we know. It's because in the old days, um, every village had its own tannery. All the hides and skins were dealt with locally. You know, they were just taken straight around to the tan yard. Um, but sadly, most of the uh, tanneries have gone. Um, and the traditional ones like us, uh, there's only about two or three of us left. Right. It's a bit like shaving your face. You always get these little yeah, hard to reach bits. Bit, yeah, sorry. <laughs> there's a wee bit down there. Although this job is extremely satisfying. <laughs> when you get it right, it's fine. Yeah, all it's right. Once all the hair has been removed, the hide is ready to be tanned, a method to prevent it from rotting. Hides are attached to a frame in a weak mixture of water and oak bark. It's then agitated constantly by a giant water-powered stirring machine. 
we're taking a raw hide, yeah. which is all putrefiable, can go off, and we're converting it into leather. And you can't reverse the process. Whereas if you've um, cured a hide with salt or dried it in the sun, that's reversible. This isn't, so it's a sort of magic. It's what we call an alchemy. It goes in there for 12 months, comes out as something else. The soaked oak bark contains a tanning agent, which produces the chemical reaction that converts the hide into leather. At Andrew's tannery, a water wheel drives a machine to grind up the bark. We break it up, yeah. and then we're going to feed it into the grinder like that. It goes through the first grinder, down the chute, and into the conifer grinder, and it'll come out as little pieces of bark. After soaking the three months in a weak oak bark mixture, the hides are then placed into a stronger solution. And how many hides go into one of these pits? We can put 80 into a pit. So they must be quite deep. So they're a good six foot six, these. Right. But you'll all be all right falling into this one because there's quite a lot of leather in there already, so you won't go to the bottom. <laughs> and then we're gonna dust it in, as we call it. So we're gonna take a couple of handfuls of bark each and just spread it around. What, that, is, what does the bark do? Right, well, the, the tan in the bark is going to soak out of that bark and gradually feed into the tan liquor, so it keeps the strength of the tan liquor up. Right. Because actually, the tan liquor is getting weaker because the hides are absorbing it. Right. So this is a sort of reserve in the pit. Um, and they'll be there in, in this pit for nine months. They've already done three months up to now. So the whole process is 12 months. Once the hides have been converted into leather, they're ready for the final stages in their journey from animal skin to a saleable product. So we went and put some fish oil on it. As the leather starts to dry out, yep. the oil will go into the grain and just feed it so it'll be nice and flexible and it won't crack. During the Edwardian age, new markets opened up for leather manufacturing. And then we'll hang it up to start its drying process. The growth of mechanisation had led to a new demand for leather, primarily for use as belts to drive the latest machines of industry. The leather has been dressed, and right. it's been stained, and it's come here to be dubbined. Ash, are you going to have a go? Yeah, I'll give it a go. Luxury leather goods were also in great demand from a growing number of affluent, fashion-conscious Edwardians. I've got leather upholstered furniture in here, and that's to be checked over. Okay. And then I to glaze the whole thing and give it a really good rub to bring up the shine. And for that, I'm using egg white and sugar, whipped up a bit like a meringue. <laughs> Look at the colour that comes. Look at the shine. With more products and goods on the market than ever before, for the well-off Edwardian, it was a golden age of consumerism. Oh, that's Evian. Gosh. They're bottling water and bringing it in from France. Gosh. The Edwardian period is the the last great blast of country house living, when the money was there, the estates, the power were all still in place. This enormous division between this sort of way of life and everybody else. At its most extreme, perhaps. Here I am, polishing silver and thinking, are we going to have anything for Christmas dinner? On the South Devon coast, a change in the wind direction and calm seas means that Alex and Peter can finally join Bill Wakeham and his crew to fish for lobster and crab. Hello there, Bill. Hi, Bill. Hi, fellas. All right? Yeah, yeah. how are you? All right? Yeah, a lot better today. 
Condition it's fairly flat. Yeah, this is perfect for what you want to try. You reckon we'll get anything? It's not the ideal time of the year for it, but uh, I reckon you'll get two or three. You know, I don't think you'll get any lobsters now because they'll be a little bit off ashore, same as your crabs. Uh, when's the last time you did any refurb on your little dinghy here? <laughs> <laughs> you don't. <laughs> See, it's, uh... <laughs> Should we get in? <laughs> Peter, do you want to jump on first? Yeah. Oh, find my sea legs, Peter. <laughs> oh. Yeah. Ah. And why not? A bit of light rain. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Just what the doctor ordered. <laughs> yes. Three days ago, Bill left six weighted and baited pots on the seabed. So are they our first cork floats over there? Yeah. They're attached to rope and corks so that they can be retrieved. He's just coming your side, isn't he? Okay. So we just pull this up, yeah? Yep. Blimey. It's a lot longer than I thought it was going to be. All right, here's pot number one. You got it? Yep. Just a minute, let me turn it, let me turn it. Well, Ooh, we got... Stones. <laughs> A couple of stones and a couple of bricks in here. No, you've got another pot on the end of that as well, by the way. Yeah. Oh, right, another They're pot. They're in pairs. Right. right, how's that one? Keep it coming. Oh, whoa, 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 we got something, we got something. Oh, look. Hello. Hello, my little pretty. Got one. How do we get him out then? Just reach in and... Grab him by the back. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> do you want to do this one or shall I? Go on then, in you go, Peter. Quite happy to let you do the dangerous bit. <laughs> oh, come here. Yeah. Daddy Peter. Oh, come here. He's putting up a fight, this one. He Looks is. Looks like he's got the better of you there, Peter. He's hanging on for dear life. No, it's him. There he is. Oh, you got one anyway. There he is. Brown crab. Yeah. That's what they're called, is it? Pre yeah, brown edible crab. It's a she crab. It's a she crab. Yeah. Because we've got a large purse in there. That's it. Yeah. The male has got a very long, thin one. Yeah. And got a bigger claws. Much right. bigger claws. Right. Well, you've got a sandwich anyway, if nothing else. <laughs> right, now, you fellas line me up for the next one. Your uh, starboard? Port. Port. Starboard? Starboard. Star which, which is star starboard is? Starboard on my left-hand side, but you always go by the port. The left-hand side of a port, if you think of the old rhyme, there's only a little port left. There's only a little port left. Well, we need to go hard port. Hard at port. There she is. An Edwardian fishing crew's pay would depend on the size of the catch. The owner of the boat would have the lion's share, often pocketing as much as 70% of the takings. Peter, we're in luck again, mate. Really? We're, we're in luck, luck again. Yeah. You've got two. Here we are. Hello, yeah, you have. I mean, on average, how many crabs do you get per pot? Take these you get a real out. good one, you know, when there's crab season, really. Anything up to a dozen. Right. Yeah. This is well, there aren't 12 in here, Bill. It took me the best part of the day to get them out. There we are. Before the empty pots are returned to the sea, they'll need bait. Pots on. Pots on. Right. You want to put your crabs up as well? Yep. One of the crabs has died and no longer has any sale value, but it will make an ideal bait. Now this should be putting it onto the uh, skewer. You call them skewers here? Yeah, we call them skewers in... Uh... In Cornwall, they're, apparently they're called preens. Well, everything's different in Cornwall. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Excellent. Placed in such a location that where you've... Basically, whatever wants to come and eat it has got to get it's in. It's got to get in, to... go up to it. Right. You got that, Peter? If he's never done it before... Don't go through be... your hand, Peter. Careful, okay, they're, very, they're very sharp now. You've got that stuff on there. Oh, yeah. There we go. That's it. That's it. That's it, and then there into the funnel. Right, okay. One so, baited pot. One baited pot. In he goes. After returning from Lad Hydrock on the farm, Ruth is busy preparing for her own Christmas. Just as the majority of Edwardian rural families, Christmas is something more that 
you make a nod towards, really. The big elaborate displays, they're your urban middle classes. For most people working out in the countryside, just couldn't afford that much money. All that much time. So ours will be making a bit of a brave splash with a few things that we have got that can be done quick and cheap. Ruth has another reason for wanting the cottage to look festive. Thank you very much indeed. She's invited the local Methodist minister, the Reverend Jeff Moles, to tea. So the Methodist church must have been quite central to society, mustn't it? It would have been. It would have been the centre of uh, their social life as well as their spiritual life. I mean, the established religion was seen as upper class. Yeah, it, was very, it was very, very, yes, it was upper class and, and it was a bit, and a bit remote. Whereas Methodism was one of those types yeah. of Christianity that was really appealing and aiming itself at it, it, the working it, it, people. Yeah, it very much appealed to the working class. And of course the preachers, um, particularly the local preachers, the lay preachers, would have been drawn from the, the, the local working right. people. So they would have understood how they lived. They would have known the concerns because they, they shared them. Here at Moor Wellham Quay, the now abandoned Methodist chapel was once the thriving center of social life for farmers, fishermen, and miners. Speaking up for working men and women, Methodist preachers became an important voice in Edwardian politics, both in the growing union movement and the birth of the modern Labour Party. It was, it was the era of what we call hellfire and damnation. <laughs> hellfire and damnation. <laughs> yeah, because it was, it was pointing out, I mean, there, there were, the, the, there were they, they spoke against the social evils of the day. I mean, we, drink was one, was one yeah. and um, there were lots of problems. So the social cause was taken up by um, the people in the chapel. So that chapel was really much more important to the ordinary mm. lives of people living here in Edwardian Britain than just a church. Oh yeah, yeah. Do you think we could do a service for Christmas? I, I'd love to see that actually. To get some sort of feeling of how it was, to try and uh, bring back that, 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 the atmosphere, it would be, uh, yeah, that would be great. Good. <laughs> <laughs> I hope you say that. <laughs> <Thank> you. <laughs> Have you got anything in there? No. Oh, yes. Oh, hello. Yeah, here I Hampered by heavy rain, Alex and Peter haven't been getting the quantity of crabs they'll need to make a decent wage. This is our final pot. The difference between a pint of beer in the pub tonight <laughs> and a pint of water <laughs> back home is in this pot. Whoa. There were 12 in there. They've escaped. <laughs> I mean, is this one beyond salvation now, or, no, or, or no. do you think that could be repaired? The, the main body of it's still in... Uh, Peter, just spin it solid, over a right? second. I just want to have a look at this, the, the bottom here. So what's happened then? Well, he's uh, been in amongst the rocks and yeah. the surge. Yeah. I've been rubbing him down. Well, look, I mean, that looks like it's been sawn through. Several times over. No, it's what's, the rocks that, itself with the motion the... of the waves. Yeah, taking it up and down against the rocks. The shallower the water, the more motion you'll get. Right. Wow. You know, to try something out like this for an experiment, it's worth the while. Yeah. But to go through the effort of making these for a season, it just shows uh, the effort that was put into it years ago to make a pot up. Yeah, and to, and to bring in a wage yeah. off the water. Well, it's been a fantastic experiment for us, hasn't it? It has. It really has, Bill. And the weather couldn't have been any better. I mean, it's, this is ideal. It's been nice and flat. Yeah. Could have done with a bit of sunshine. <laughs> <laughs> Peter. It's the one with the crabs. There's the catch. <sighs> Your pots are quite successful. Yeah, yeah, I'm pleased. I think maybe we should uh, treat Bill to a, a beer or two and hear a few of his old sea dog tales. <laughs> yeah. The thing is, five crabs, six pots. By the time you've rebated the pots, that's two crabs. That's half a crab each. <laughs> 
Yeah, when well, you say no without any expenses coming out of that. Yeah, exactly, Peter. You'll be yeah, yeah, you'll be very if, generous. If there's no overheads. Yeah, you know. <laughs> and then also, you've got to work out for uh, manual labour, me rowing. Oh, right. <laughs> so how much do we owe you? See <laughs> <laughs> what, we buy your dinner. I notice they've got rabbit stew on the uh, menu over there. As a superstition for fishermen, you don't mention Bushcongers, and that's another name for what you just said. The little furry things yeah. with long ears, yeah. white tails, yeah. famous for eating carrots. Mm, yeah. Bugs was his name? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I'll tell you what, if there's a couple of fishermen in here, old time fishermen, you'd be bouncing across the harbour being out. Have you ever seen these pebbles? Yeah. Where they skim across the water and keep bouncing? Yeah. That would have been you. <laughs> <laughs> So what you're saying is we should think about really sticking to farming. That's the... Mm. Or at least you won't starve farming, let's go that way. <laughs> <laughs> so cheers. I'm glad you enjoyed it. A great day out. Well, it's been great to experience it. Yeah. Here's to uh, not drinking your profits. Mm On the Edwardian farm, with little income from Alex and Peter's fishing expedition, Ruth is busy preparing a poor man's Christmas lunch. Christmas dinner is going to be one of Mrs. Widgeon's recipes. She was a wife of a fisherman who lived in South Devon in the Edwardian period, and this is what she always prepared for high days and holidays. Warm, hearty, filling, and not that expensive. She just called it baked dinner. Although turkey and goose were coming down in price, beef was still cheaper. So Ruth is using a cut from the farm's slaughtered bullock to cook an alternative Christmas recipe. So you begin with a saucer full of breadcrumbs and herbs with a knob of fat, and that sits in the base of your baking tray and then you fill the rest of the baking tray with spuds and unsurprisingly the spuds form the main part of the meal so they're to fill us all up so all around and that a joint just sits on top of everything and now I'm to pour in some water um, just enough to just overtop the edges of the saucer. And then pop it on the range. As soon as the water starts to boil, then the whole thing goes into the oven. I'm gonna do some root veg to accompany it. One pot cooking, nice and easy. Mrs. Widgeon had enough to do. She didn't do complicated recipes. <laughs> Simple cookery, keep everybody going. And for us, I think it'll make a hearty, if quite frugal, Christmas dinner. While the beef slow cooks in the oven, the team head off to their local Methodist chapel for a traditional Edwardian Christmas service. Hello, Dennis. Good afternoon. <laughs> Pleased to meet you. Welcome to Marvel <laughs> Howe Methodist Church. Now, you've got some history here with this building, have you? Uh, well, we came here to live when I was about three years old. Right. Um, went to school here, went to church right. here. And did you have a particular seat here? Uh, we had the third seat back, yeah, we had our own family seat um, with our names on the on these little mom, right. Mr and Mrs Jeffrey, two children, three children, right. we were, yeah. <laughs> and we really had to behave ourselves, there was no talking when we walked into the church, that was it. Welcome everyone, welcome to our special Christmas service, a wonderful time of the year, it's wonderful to see you all here joining us in this chapel uh, in Edwardian times. The, uh, the preaching would have been a little different. It would have been stern, uh, evangelical warnings. So I'd like to, to read to you from uh, the Gospel of St. Luke, chapter 2, verse 7. And she brought forth her firstborn son 
and wrapped him in swaddling clothes and laid him in a manger because there was no room for them in the inn. And today, brothers and sisters, there is no room for Jesus in the inn. The inn is full of sinful passions, evil desires of wanton wickedness. And all of it fueled by that devil's brew, alcoholic beverage. It dulls the mind. It dissipates the heart. It destroys the conscience. Where will you be this Christmas night? Will you be in the inn where there's no room for Jesus? Or will you be on your knees begging forgiveness? Brothers and sisters, on this night, where will you be? Amen. 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 Hallelujah. Brothers and sisters, let us stand to sing that wonderful hymn, In the Bleak Midwinter. Very much, Vicar, for that. Thank you very much indeed. <laughs> God, it smells absolutely on buffet. It's just what you like, Peter. Nice and pink in the middle. Well, next time we earn a bit of money. Can we buy a serving spoon? Buy some serving spoons. Some of our enterprises have got to start paying off soon. Do you want to crack open that slow gin? Yes, I should think so. Just say grace. Oh. For what we're about to drink. May the Lord make us truly grateful. Oh, it comes with slows. It's got a nice syrupy texture there. Oh, listen to that little glug. Thank you very much. I was going to say we had a very austere supper, didn't we, in your absence, Ruth? Really? Money. Mm -hmm. So that's why the money's down in the, no, in the no, cash no, till, is it? No, no, it's oak oh, oh, didn't even fire the range, did we, Peter? Nope. Lying Not tight racks of hair of you. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe there were a few oysters involved as well. Oysters? You had oysters? It was his idea. Nothing to do with me. Happy Christmas. Merry Christmas. Merry Christmas. Merry We've Christmas. been here for a third of our time. We have indeed. <laughs> and it may be austere in theory, Ruth, but it's damn delicious. Don't taste too bad. All we need now is to strike it rich. Next time on Edwardian Farm. It's January and a team aimed to cash in on industries that brought wealth to Devon. All you need to do is find me a few tons of that and uh, we're laughing. Copper mining. And lace making. Don't turn your pillow, number two goes first. It's a lifetime's work, really. Bye. Some of the toughest jobs they've ever attempted. Now I think we've learnt one thing. Never grumble about farming again. <laughs> yeah. <laughs>